Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Today, we are embarking on a new chapter of this program. While we typically focus on municipal issues, we recognize the importance of the broader political landscape on municipal affairs. That's why, starting today, we're introducing a new segment feature on this show, where we're going to be sitting down with federal, provincial, and yes, even territorial leaders to delve into their perspectives on municipal governance and municipal affairs, and how their levels of government are addressing the municipal concerns. Now, our, our inaugural guest for this feature is none other than Sarah Hoffman, the former Deputy Premier and Minister of Health for the province of Alberta. Just a few days ago, as of recording this episode, Ms. Hoffman made headlines by announcing her candidacy for the leadership of the Alberta NDP. Now, today, we have the exclusive opportunity to discuss her leadership aspirations, her vision for Alberta's future, and perhaps most importantly for our audience, her vision for municipalities across the province of Alberta, both urban and rurally. This is Municipal Affairs. Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. Um, earlier this week, as of recording this, you announced that you were in it and you were going to win it, the leadership of the Alberta yeah. NDP. I got to ask, what was the final decision based on? Uh, you know, a number of people approached me over the summer um, and said, you know, uh, if Rachel decides that she's done, we need you to step up. And I will say that is absolutely motivating. Nobody uh, ever is inclined to to lead unless they know people actually are inspired and want to be a part of their leadership. So it's been really uh, exciting getting to talk with so many grassroots members, a number of my colleagues, uh, folks at other orders of government, and um, and to get a chance to really talk about our values and let people know who I am and what I want to do. And the three big policy areas that are uh, on my mind, and a lot of your folks watching might know that my background's in education. I'm not going to forget about education. Don't worry about that. But the three big policy areas that are on my mind that I think we really need to apply at NDP Lens to are health, climate, and housing. And I'm really excited to talk to members and people who are open to becoming members of the NDP about those three issues as well. So I, I watched your campaign launch. I watched your campaign video. I've watched interviews and I've read interviews with you. And you do talk about the values of the Alberta NDP under a Hoffman uh, leadership. What are those values? What are the values that you are hoping to instill upon the NDP to lead them into the next general election? So I grew up in Canuso. I know you know where that is, but maybe not every <laughs> as, as a Faust resident, I know where it is and I can say Canuso. <laughs> Yes, you can. So Canusa is halfway between Slave Lake and High Prairie in the middle of Big Lakes County. And I will say that the values that I grew up with there, I didn't know they were NDP values. They are absolutely NDP values. Helping out your neighbor. If somebody needs to get to a doctor's appointment, there's a phone tree to make sure that somebody can get them into Slave Lake or even Edmonton. Uh, making sure that if you need help uh, with your family and things that you're dealing with, that we've got each other's backs. And definitely, even when I think about the volunteer firefighters, like that is core to who we are as New Democrats. We get together, we roll up our sleeves and we help each other out when we need it. And I know that over the last uh, few years, we've spent a lot of energy making sure that we secured vote in Edmonton and we absolutely did. I'm so excited about that. Grew our vote in, in Calgary and we showed up for Calgary. As a result, we won the popular vote and the majority of the seats. We need to do the same in all parts of Alberta, including uh, my hometown of Canuso. Uh, I, it bugs me that Lesser Slave Lake's got a UCP MLA, and I want to change that. I want to make sure that we get a chance to uh, elect fantastic candidates in all parts of this province, uh, including rural Alberta, mid-sized cities, and the big cities. So uh, as for those who are listening, you know that this is usually traditionally a municipal show. We talk about a lot of municipal issues. We are bringing on Sarah Hoffman and the other candidates during this leadership race to talk about some of the issues that I've been hearing about, and but also some of the issues that are pressing to municipalities. I want to start on one of the platform priorities that you've talked about and you launched, and that is health care. And I want to talk about a recent news story out of Global News that just happened last week, where uh, a mother of a five-year-old son had to it brave the sort of nasty winter weather in January to bring their five-year-old son to a 60-kilometer away hospital because the hospital facility that they were going to in Milk River was short of professionals, healthcare professionals. 
you are the former minister of health. I got to ask, how do you see yourself working with healthcare professionals to ensure that all Albertans have access to equitable healthcare services, not just downtown Edmonton, downtown Calgary, but in Milk River, in Slave Lake, in up in high level? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I will say that there are folks right across this province who don't have access to a family doctor. That definitely wasn't the case when we were in government. Uh, we had a, a respectful relationship with folks at the Alberta Medical Association and with other health professional organizations as well, including uh, workers uh, organizations to make sure that we showed respect, that we worked hard to retain them and that we recruited them from other jurisdictions too. Uh, we didn't get it perfect, but we access was so much better uh, five years ago than it is now. And uh, there are a few things that I'm really proud of that we did accomplish when I was a minister of health. We made sure that uh, harassment stopped outside of abortion clinics. We made sure that it didn't matter where you lived if you wanted to access uh, the medication for an early term abortion that you could access that medication free of charge the first jurisdiction in Canada to do that. We cut the wait times for breast cancer surgeries substantially. We made sure that more parents were being connected with um, midwives than ever before in this province. And that included uh, big cities, but also communities like Plamondon that had never had a midwife before. So um, we, can, we can do these things if we work together. And if our goal is to actually make public health care successful, that's my goal. You know, the first NDP health minister in Alberta, uh, I believe in public health care and I want it to work for everybody. And I know that we can do that if we get leadership back in the premier's office that agrees with that, uh, with that, with that principle and that value as well. So uh, health professionals want to work here. Uh, they deserve a government that's a fair partner that's going to help them have good working conditions and meet the needs of their patients. You talk about a good partnership, and I've got to ask, because when I speak to municipal leaders, whether it be mayors, Reeves, or councillors, they often talk about downloading of services, particularly in the health files, around mental health, around uh, drug addiction, around homelessness. Do you see yourself being a partner in addressing these needs and sort of taking that responsibility off the municipalities and making it a provincial jurisdiction again? It is a provincial jurisdiction, and uh, it's absolutely um, uh, irresponsible of the government to turn their backs on all these folks. When I talk to ATU members, people are driving buses who have overdoses happening on their vehicles, who have weapons on their vehicles. Like they didn't sign up for that. They signed up to be responsible transit operators, and that's what they should be able to focus on. They shouldn't have to also be uh, law enforcement, uh, healthcare workers, and social workers. That is not their that not is not their expertise. It's a provincial responsibility, and the province needs to take it back. Um, another thing on healthcare that this current government's completely turning their backs on are folks who are uh, living on the streets, who are, um, uh, you know, living in tents in minus 40, then having their tents taken away and told to go to overcrowded shelters. Um, that is not uh, respectful or dignified. And it's also incredibly expensive because most of those folks will end up in the emergency department or in the justice system in some way. If we invest in permanent supportive housing, make sure that there's a safe place for every Albertan to live that's affordable, we are going to be able to move mountains. And, um, and I think that it's the right thing to do, but I also think it's the economic thing to do for the province, but also for the municipalities. Let them focus on municipal responsibilities. How do we do that? And I, I'm going to kind of hold your feet to the flames a little bit here is how do we invest into social housing in a time where we, we, we're seeing it play out right now in Wetaskiwin with a potential, we don't want social housing in our area, we want it somewhere else because we just don't want it in our own backyard. How do we invest in social housing in rural communities and the province needs to do it because they're the ones who have the money invest in social housing and where do you see your leadership style in building a gap between those who don't want it and those who understand that we need to address this issue? Uh, so where I live, there is a uh, new permanent supportive housing about three blocks in one direction and about five blocks in the other direction. And I will say as soon as people are housed, they are no longer homeless. They have somewhere to live. They are getting support. It, they're two of the nicest new apartment buildings in the area I live in. Um, they uh, have staff at their front doors 24-7 um, that are supporting folks. And, um, and, and those people 
for the most part, want to stay housed. And if they want that, they're going to be supported in that. And if they don't, uh, they're going to move on. So uh, I think telling more good stories about the the successes that we've seen uh, in our in our communities. And I understand that it's new for a lot of municipalities to be uh, engaging in this area, but there are people who are unhoused all across the province. I was talking to somebody on the library board in Airdrie the other day who talked about how they worked with the municipality to keep the library open 24 hours a day during the extreme cold snap. And there are about a, a dozen people, I think, who were there overnight. Um, there are people who are really struggling right now. And we know that the pressures are growing. There's about 100,000 people in Calgary who are on the verge of losing their homes too because of how uh, rents are escalating uh, at a rate higher than anywhere else in the country. So we really need a, a government that will be compassionate, caring, and uh, roll up their sleeves and solve problems with municipalities and step up to the table. You talk about house, housing, so let's segue into pillar two of your platform, which is housing. Um, I, I speak to municipal leaders. I'm assuming I know that you've just had the pleasure to chat with uh, Alberta Municipalities President Tyler Gandom. I follow you on social yeah. media, so therefore I know you had that conversation. So I'm not saying yeah. something that's not private. So I've got to ask, housing is something that all municipalities want. But it's an a, it's an issue that comes with many different caveats, and one of them is infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. You can't build housings without water. You can't build housing without the infrastructure in place to put the housing there. Municipalities have been calling on the federal, uh, the provincial government to increase LGFF, local government fiscal framework. For those who don't know, do you see yourself working with municipalities to increase that? And how do you? see yourself as leader of the Alberta NDP in ensuring housing gets done, but not on the backs of the municipalities and the taxpayers who are there? Yeah, so this is one of my three key pillars. This is one of the things that I think that our party, the Alberta NDP, has particular expertise in and wants to roll up our sleeves and get to work with municipalities on doing this. We believe that everyone deserves a safe place to live, that everyone deserves to make sure that that's affordable, that they aren't uh, having to um, uh, worry about losing their home because um, they just can't keep up with the escalating rent. So uh, we absolutely have a role to play in funding that. Um, I believe that this is one of the three key pillars uh, to have a great society is to make sure that we address this issue in a really serious way. And that is going to cost some money. Um, and I'll say the house I grew up in in Canoe, so it was built through one of those, uh, I think it was the first time home buyer plan. We weren't the first family in it. We bought it a few owners down the road. But uh, new houses weren't getting built in Canuso at that time, uh, unless they were being done through thoughtful programs like this. So I think four houses got built in our, our hamlet with only 200 people living there. So that was that was big. It was good for the local economy that brings good skilled trades jobs to those communities too. And it means that you can have some sustained, thoughtful uh, build out of, of housing infrastructure. So I think the provinces wanted to take over a lot of the responsibility from CMHC and, and to play a bigger role in this. And they have an opportunity to play that bigger role and invest in as good partners with municipalities that want thoughtful, sustained growth um, in a way that they can uh, leverage the most for the families that are living in their communities. How do we how do you balance the rural urban divide? Because I, I, I see all the press releases that this government puts out and I'm seeing a lot of focus on the larger urban centers. How do you invest into smaller communities like Canuso, like Faust, like all the uh, Lambdona or even Sterling? Because they're having housing issues as well. Even Drumheller. I just recently had the pleasure to sat, uh, sit down and chat with the mayor of Drumheller. And she says housing is a priority. They just don't have the needs and the necessary the necessity of money to do the housing needs that they want. Whether you're a young couple starting out in rural Alberta, trying to move out of your parents' basement, whether you're uh, a professional living in downtown uh, Edmonton or Calgary, or whether you're somebody who's retiring, living in a suburb who needs to be able to downsize and find somewhere affordable that they can sustain through their golden years. Housing is an issue in all parts of this province. And we need a, a government that actually wants to make sure that everyone has a good, safe, affordable place to live. The great news is we have a lot of wonderful housing management bodies set up throughout the province that are willing to step up and help execute these plans. We actually need a partner in the province to fund these projects and make sure that we move them forward at, at, at a great rate so that if we do, we want to bring in a temporary rent cap. My colleague Janice Irwin proposed a bill for the, to give us four years of um, of temporary rent caps. But 
four years and then having no new supply or not enough supply because we can't leave this up to the free market. It hasn't solved the problem. It's only gotten worse over the last five years. We need to actually see some public investment in this and uh, and and ensuring that it stays affordable too. Just starting out affordable uh, isn't helpful if then the rates go through the roof as soon as uh, uh, you know, one or two years have passed. So we need to make sure that we have a partner in the province working with local municipalities to deliver. I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you here for a second, Sarah. And I'm going to ask, did the Alberta NDP get it right during your time in office? You had four years. Uh, most people say we are in this position because of the lack of uh, forethought of previous governments. And while the UCP have been in power for now five years, uh, you were there for four years as well. Could you have done more? Absolutely, we could have done more, but we did do the largest social housing build in those four years that we had in, in a generation. Uh, but there is absolutely more that needs to be done. A lot of what we did were, were lodge uh, expansions and renovations. That's great. That definitely is helpful, but uh, it, the work isn't done. Obviously, it's not done. So uh, that's why we need to uh, elect a government First of all, I'd like to be elected leader of the Alberta NDP and have an opportunity to put this as one of our three key focuses and then uh, get a mandate in the next provincial election to move uh, really quickly in investing in this area. So let's talk about that last pillar and that last platform, and that is the climate. And you are the yeah. first, if I'm not mistaken, only candidate as of right now who has made climate uh, a major platform issue in their platform. Why? <laughs> it doesn't matter where you live in Alberta kids should be able to play outside on a nice summer's day. And that was not the case for a good chunk of this last uh, spring and summer. I was door knocking in May and families over and over again in a variety of communities would say to me, my kid had indoor recess again. We had to cancel soccer practice again. Um, like it is, it is not okay. We lost many homes again this year. We have over 50 wildfires right now burning in the province. This is not normal. And we're looking at catastrophic drought. It's only February and already farmers are deeply concerned about what's gonna happen this spring for seeding. I am too. Um, so we need to make sure that we have a, a government that is going to roll up its sleeves, sit down with the experts and develop a realistic but aggressive climate plan to make sure that we can um, combat the impacts that we're facing and fire smarter cities, making sure that there's lots of economic opportunities to be had here too, Chris, I wanna say like, obviously the renewable sector is a huge one. Uh, the moratorium that uh, happened on industrial scale um, renewable projects had a, had a big economic impact, but we have an opportunity to have a really positive economic impact in renewables, but also in fire smarting our municipalities, addressing the water shortages, uh, appropriately planning with, uh, with residents reservoirs. Um, there's lots of jobs to be had here. And we know that it's a crisis. We have to take it seriously. The largest sector of the economy is oil and gas, but the second largest is agriculture and the third largest is forestry. So it's important for all sectors of the economy that we're smart on climate so that we can all have great air to breathe, good jobs, and lots of economic opportunities. Yeah, I know you just recently got back from Medicine Hat, and I had the pleasure of speaking to a counselor from Cypress County down there, and he's a rancher, and he said that most of, if the drought condition does not get better this year, farmers in southeastern uh, Alberta are going to have to sell their cattle off to other areas of the country because they will not be able to house them because their crops will not grow. Uh, do you see, I, I know we're still in early days and you're going to be working on your platform, probably going to be rolling out during the leadership campaign, but what specifically are you looking at to help farmers, help the ranchers in these areas that we are seeing higher than unexpected drought conditions that are going to lead to potential closures or harmful uh, re reductions of farmland? And we're used to irrigation in southeastern Alberta. It's, it's in the fields, it's norm, but it is so dry right now. Like there are some fields with a dusting of snow and others that are completely dry. That is not normal. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. There's deep concerns about the water basins in these regions and, and really in most of Alberta right now. So you're right, I'll have a policy team and chair uh, for each of those three pillars. And I'm excited to be able to talk about some of the things we wanna to do to make sure that we manage uh, water in a, in a responsible way and that we protect our precious fresh water. Um, and yeah, this is, I, I also wanna say, when I became the Minister of Health, all of my background was in education. Uh, health was not my expertise. And when Rachel called and, and told me that I was gonna be the health minister, I was very excited, but I also said, can you tell me why you think I'll be a successful premier? 
And she said, because I don't want you to act like an expert. I want you to gather the experts. I want you to do the research. I want you to apply our values to that information. And then I want you to make plans on how to make things better. So I'm really excited to work with, uh, with experts on this. And if you yourself are sitting at home watching this and you're thinking, well, she should work with me, then please visit my website, sarahhoffman.ca. Get in touch. Uh, we have lots of room for lots of different expertise around this table. And we want to make sure that we make the best decisions and we really put forward something incredibly positive and forward thinking for the province. The links to all of Sarah's uh, email addresses, websites, and social medias will be in the show notes. But I want to turn to the the Alberta NDP as a whole now. We talked about the platforms. Well, let's talk about the party for a second. You uh, you talked openly uh, at the beginning of the interview about how you are an Alberta or Edmonton and Calgary-based party. You are trying to expand out into more rural areas how do you see your leadership differing from the current leader, Rachel Notley, in that aspect of being able to bridge that urban rural divide that the party is sort of not having a well, not, I don't want to say well, but not having a good time bridging right now? Well, and I think there's so many divisions right now. And I think that number one, we got to show up. I'm uh, planning on, you know, I announced my campaign on Sunday here at Edmonton with if the fire department asks, we had exactly 200 people in the hall. But, um, you know, I launched in Edmonton and then I immediately got in the car, went to Calgary, uh, watched the Super Bowl with uh, some friends and supporters. Uh, then we went on to Lathbridge and Medicine Hat and Red Deer. And I, I'm home now for a few days, but next week I'm heading north, right? Like, I want to build this party right across the province with people who want to build this party. I will show up, I will roll up my sleeves, and I will do the hard work with them because, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, Canuso values are NDP values. Uh, we just need to uh, sometimes uh, show up, be present, and make sure that uh, people get to know who we are. And I think that there will be way more people who are open to voting NDP once they get to know us a little bit better. Do you have a vision that a Alberta NDP led by Sarah Hoffman would be viable in every single riding across this province? Yeah, and it might take a couple of election cycles to get there. Let's be frank. Uh, there's somewhere we're starting at at a, at a bigger, um, uh, that would be more of a stretch than others. But, uh, you know, I was really proud to work with the folks in Banff, Kananaskis over the last four years to make sure that we ran a fantastic candidate, Sarah Elmaliki, that we were well-financed. Uh, I did fundraising phone calls with them, right? Like we we did events, we built a team and Sarah ran an, an incredible campaign and we won in Banff, Kananaskis. And we can win in other ridings outside of the big cities as well. Uh, it's gonna take time. We're gonna have to roll up our sleeves. And in, in some areas it might take a few election cycles, but absolutely uh, I wanna make sure that that uh, everyone who shares our values feels excited to vote NDP no matter where they live. So I, I'm going to let you uh, speak directly to the camera here for a few seconds, but give us your final pitch. I know this is early days. Why should people reach out, learn more about you, and get involved in your campaign over the next few months until that cutoff of April? Where you're going to tell me the exact date because I can't 21st. remember it off. 21st, <laughs> off the top of my head. So give me your two-minute pitch of why people should get a membership and go out and vote for Sarah Hoffman for leader of the Alberta NDP. Well, and a lot of people might look at me and think, oh, she doesn't look like a typical politician. And maybe I don't. Maybe I've got a few more pounds on me. Maybe I'm a little sassier than usual. And maybe I don't pretend to be someone that I'm not. I think that's a good thing. I think a lot of local representatives got elected because people knew them, they liked them, and they knew how hard they worked. And that's the principle that I've applied to all of my campaigns. Uh, I first ran in 2010 for the school board against an incumbent trustee. People said I was crazy. But he had voted to close every school in our area, and I wanted to stand up and protect those schools and make sure that kids could continue to walk to school. So we fundraised for a leaflet, I bought a new pair of running shoes, and we door knocked that riding. And we got 70% of the vote. And then I won again. And then later I ran for MLA in Edmonton Glenora, which had an incumbent conservative cabinet minister as the MLA. And people said, you're crazy, you should wait and run somewhere else. But it was too important that we stand up for, for health, um, for teachers, for nurses, for people living in the community, and, and that we that we really um, stand together in that 2015 election. We didn't know there was going to be an orange wave. I fundraised for a leaflet. I bought a new pair of running shoes, and I started door knocking. And we won with 70% of the vote. 
And then we won again and we won again. I've won five times. You can do so being yourself, being authentic, being true to your values, as long as you work your tail off. And my goal is to work my tail off with every single person who wants to be a part of that project right across the province. So um, I think that we can be authentic, we can be ourselves, and we can stand up for NDP values. And that's what I'm proposing to the people of Alberta. So I've got to ask the million dollar follow-up question then. What new pair of running shoes did you buy this election? Oh, uh, they're orange. What are they actually called? Oh, Hoka's. Hoka's, yeah. Yeah. Sarah, Sarah, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about uh, some of the issues. I'm assuming this is probably the first of many conversations we may be having over the next few months. Uh, we'll be reaching out to you and your team to talk about some of the municipal issues that come up during this campaign. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Before we let you go, I should note for transparency, our guest today, Miss Sarah Hoffman, and my husband, one of the executive producers of this show, the Honorable Ricardo Miranda, served alongside each other in Rachel Notley's cabinet from 2015 to 2019. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews, and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged across this country. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few years. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.